Chapter 20. Inside the Outside Broadcast. For anyone who hasn't been witness to a radio station outside broadcast yet, it works like this. A business hires the radio station to do a particular show or shift live from their premises. Making noise about their product or service and generating more interest from fans at the station to swing by and check it all out. Ideally, the more people that turn up, the more interest is generated, the more sales are made by the business and everyone goes home happy. I'll admit that I've played my part in plenty of them over my radio career. From a couple of quick crosses back to the studio to promote a toy sale, to electrical retailer super sales, right through to a six-hour extravaganza in front of the local town fountain. Raising money for, well, it was some kind of charity from memory. When outside broadcasts work, they work really well and can really help draw a crowd and provide a pretty decent boost to the sales figures of the day or weekend, or at least a bit more awareness across the town of what the business is about. When they go completely balls up though, well, here's three great examples that spring to mind, and thankfully I was only involved in one of them. Come and join us for a workout in the van. A new gym had just opened up on the other side of town, and the interests of promoting this new place to get sweaty, and hopefully trim, the owners bought an outside broadcast for opening day, which also turned out to be one of the coldest days of winter. Wanting the biggest audience, they shelled out for a breakfast outside broadcast, far more expensive than one during the morning or the weekend. And the sales rep who booked the four hours had suggested we turn up in our finest gym gear, and put all the cutting edge equipment through its paces while we did the show just for a bit of fun and colour. Just as dawn broke on the super frost generating morning of the outside broadcast, I'd managed to drive the broadcast van past the gym a total of three times, before my bemused co-host called me and directed me to a laneway without a single sign advertising its location. While dragging the equipment to the door, I also noticed that there were no signs up yet on the outside of the gym. It must have been on the list of last minute things to finish up, I mused, as I walked through the door and quickly discovered if it was on the list, it'd be well and truly near the bottom. Because sitting in the middle of this brand new gym were four mildly annoyed men with mugs of coffee and a sole toolbox between them attempting to put together an entire gym load of cutting edge equipment. And by the looks of things, when we got there, they just completed the seat part of one exercise bike. And that was about it. What a ripper way to kick off open day. Not a single bit of anything ready to go. So for the next four hours, we huddled in the back of a very cold work van. Subtly explaining on air that while today was open day, tomorrow would be a much bigger launch day and you'd have far more fun checking out things tomorrow instead. As at least one exercise bike would be completed by then and then you could walk around it and ooh and ah to your heart's content while marvelling at the rest of the best equipment money could buy in various parts of assembly at the moment. Now remember how the helpful sales rep had suggested wearing gym gear? Well, we had foolishly agreed with him, thinking that using the various machines would well and truly keep us warm. And while I'd opted for a t-shirt and a pair of tracksuit pants, my co-host had instead rolled up in a pair of the shortest gym shorts possible and a singlet combo. He then spent the next four hours cursing this decision while doing his half of the show, attempting to unsuccessfully shield himself from the freezing cold under an emergency fire blanket he found in the back of the van. Even with the van's heaters on full bore, it was still cold enough to kill any and all heat once it got to the back, where all of our gear was set up. The gym owner did venture out for an occasional interview and fetch a coffee, but he must have got trapped in a conversation with the coffee shop, as by the time he got back, they were as cold as my co-host's now partially frozen legs. Thankfully, our suggestions of waiting a day to see this place in all of its glory seem to have worked, as not a single soul, aside from ourselves, rolled up to have a look at this new place of fitness, and for four hours we only had ourselves, the panel operator back in the studio, and the numbing cold all around us to keep us amused. We drove back to the station grumbling all the way and blasted the sales rep when we finally saw him for sending us out there when it wasn't even ready. Incredibly, with such a monumental launch, a mere nine months later, the gym closed its doors and shut up shop. I never found out if they ever put the signs up to actually point out where it was. It's brown and squarish. This outside broadcast wasn't one I copped, but around the station it went down as station law and was too good not to include in this list of complete failures. The poor bastard involved, for the purposes of this story, we should now just call him K, still winces when you remind him of this time, but has thankfully gone so much further in his radio career that the odds of anything like this happening again to him are less than zero. And if he did get a similar job like this one nowadays, he'd be well and truly paid well for the experience. 
Because a few years ago, poor Kay had to broadcast for four agonisingly long hours at a block of land in the middle of nowhere, next to other empty blocks of land, and had to make the whole process sound incredibly exciting to anyone still listening. To put this into perspective, the next time you drive into the countryside, find a random patch of barren land somewhere, park there, and try to get excited for the next four hours describing what you see. The land was part of a local auction. And to really point out the possible savings you might be able to make, someone came up with the idea of having Kay on site. Doing his music shift right next to, um, well, a big flat expanse of dirt. Just Kay, the broadcast fan, and possibly a passing bird or two. Maybe a worm as well. There were no shops nearby, no place to get lunch, no petrol stations or drive through coffee venues, no hardware stores, no pizzerias, no signs of life. And would you believe it, not a single other person out there. And as hard as poor Kay tried to jazz up a deceptively flat and incredibly dull-looking patch of dirt, nobody in the listening audience found the time nor any sane reason to venture out in those four hours to see this possible amazing bargain in person. Poor guy. And the man behind this groundbreaking idea to broadcast next to nothing for four straight hours? Coincidentally, the same guy who booked two announcers to roll up to a brand new gym and gym gear only to spend the next four hours in a freezing van parked outside. And finally, the smoke from the staff-only area. Now, you'd be thinking that after four hours attempting to sell the virtues of a section of rocks and dirt, that'd be it for the bizarre outside broadcast adventures of Paul K. But no, he copped another ripper with the latest BMX shop in town. They too were sold an outside broadcast for their opening day. And while it beat broadcasting in the middle of nowhere for longer than was mentally healthy, Paul K spent a lot of the time there trying to reassure the owner that he would be okay having a chat on air. To help paint the picture of a business or a service during an outside broadcast, usually a manager or staff member joins the announcer for a quick on-air chat about what they do, share some bargains for the day, and invite people to see the place in person. Some of the people are naturally chatty and relish the chance to play radio star, while some shy away from an outstretched microphone like it's a leprous limb from a poor unfortunate we found in a nearby medical waste bin at the local hospital. The guy at the BMX shop, he shook like an out-of-kilter washing machine at the thought of getting on air. However, having no idea about anything BMX related, Kay did manage to convince this manager that he would be far better explaining what was on offer than he ever could, and the guy reluctantly agreed, on the strange condition that he be given a 30-minute warning and subsequent warnings each 10-minute block until it was time. So, Kay complied, and gave Mr. BMX a half-hour warning, then a 20-minute warning, a 10-minute reminder, and even threw in a 5-minute warning for good measure. With three minutes before the song finished and Kay having to go back on air, ready to chat to Mr. BMX, the owner quickly raced out the back of the staff-only office and a very bemused Kay watched on as a small plume of smoke suddenly appeared through the back door. This was quickly followed by the sound of water being sucked through some kind of smoking implement and two more mini plumes followed in quick succession. Mr. BMX then calmly strolled over to the outside broadcast set up within 60 seconds to spare and proceeded to turn a three-minute chat into seven and a half minutes of one-sided ramble, where he managed to repeat his list of brands an impressive four and a half times before he realised what he was doing. Thankfully, this was the first and only time he ever got on air, and a mere six months later, the place had gone out of business, for whatever reason. I don't know if it was the same sales rep involved with this one like the other two, but the way things happened, I really wouldn't put it past him.